Today, I will be talking to you about the second way of defending direct reference theory from the challenge that Frege's puzzles uh, provide. That is, today I'll be giving you another way of making sense how, of how something other than meaning can explain cognitive value. In this video, I will give an overview of this lecture and give an introduction to the background idea of psychological explanation, which will be important for the ideas in this lecture. So, today I'll be discussing the philosopher Fodor's hypothesis that there is a language of thought. Fodor's language of thought hypothesis was enormously influential in philosophy and cognitive science. In this lecture, I explain what this hypothesis is, as well as Fodor's central motivation for it. I then discuss how this hypothesis the, might provide the direct reference theorist with an account of cognitive value. I conclude with a review of both Perry's and Fodor's defenses of direct reference theory. So as background to understanding the language of thought hypothesis and its motivation, I have to, we have to get onto the table the notion of psychological explanation. What is psychological explanation? The question of what psychological explanation is, let's first consider the category of action. So human actions, the things we do, are import importantly different than mere physical happenings. The things we do involve intentional behaviors. So for instance, walking to the store to buy, let's say, some chips. So this thing that you're doing when you're walking to the store to buy something is an int intentional, deliberate behavior of yours. So that's an example of, a, a, a very simple example of a human action, something that we do. Another type of human action that is relevant is not just behaviors that we make, like walking to the store, but also inferences. So these are kind of mental behaviors. Okay, so here's an, in an example of an inference. Um, you see that the lights are on, and on the basis of that perception, you conclude or you infer that someone's home. So here is a movement from a perception, what you see, to a belief um, about the way the world is. And that inference um, is also a kind of thing we do. It's a kind of action. Um, to understand intuitively why human action is special and why it's especially different than mere physical happenings, Consider the difference between acting violently or affectionately, on the one hand, and on the other, something like a stream running down a mountain or billiard balls bouncing around. So imagine that you act violently, violently so imagine that you, for instance, punch someone in the face for whatever reason, and that is something which is very bad to do, and people will you know, blame you for it or judge you for it, etc. Or imagine telling someone you're close to that you love them. You, you performing the act of uttering, those of uttering those words is very meaningful and it, and it is important that it's something that you have done. Okay, so these are, these actions, you know, violent or affectionate actions are, you know, they're things that happen in this world but they, have, they seem to have a special kind of status that uh, is different than other things that merely happen in the world. For instance, just a stream 
that is slowly running on a mountain day by day. Or if you are playing pool and the, the way that the balls bounce around on the table according to the laws of physics. Okay, so these are just simple physical happenings and they don't, and they don't seem to have the same kind of special status as uh, a human action has. So here is a more vivid example. So suppose that you're, this is, this is an example uh, that, a very timely example, okay? So suppose that you are waiting in line for the cashier at a grocery store. The line is so frustratingly long that you angrily topple over the next in line's uh, customer's cart. So you are so frustrated and angry about the fact that you have to wait in line. You walk up to the cart in front of you, um, the, the cart of the person in front of you, and you topple it over, spilling all the items all, all over the floor. Okay? Now this action is something that you did. It's something that you decided to do and uh, you, in fact, did. And because of that, this is something that you can be blamed or punished for, etc. So, for instance, you would get kicked out of the store, um, perhaps charged, or uh, something like that. But now, suppose instead that you don't purposely knock over the person in front of you's cart, but rather the slick floor of the grocery store causes you to lose your balance and you crash into the other customer's cart. And this has the exact same result as before of spilling that cart and making a huge mess, etc. So despite that there is the same effect, i.e. this person's groceries end up on the floor, despite that there is the same effect, in this case, spilling the contents of the cart was not something you did. It's not something you decided to do. Okay, it's something that happened to you because you uh, slipped on the floor. Okay, and it's important to us, the way that we think about these things, that this is not something you did because if you slip on the floor and, you know, cause this uh, catastrophe, you're not to be blamed or punished or judged. In the same way that you're to be blamed or punished or judged, etc., if spilling over the contents is something that you do. So in the fir first case in which you're angry, you perform an, an action. You do something. Whereas in the second case where you slip, it's, it's not, you're not spilling over the contents of the cart is not something you do. It's something that happens to you. Okay, so this distinction between a human action and something that merely happens um, is an important distinction. And this example hopefully has made it clear. Now, in accounting for the difference between human action and mere happenings is precisely where the notion of psychological explanation comes in. So we can say that actions, as opposed to mere happenings, are things that have psychological explanations. And what a psychological explanation is, is something that appeals to mental states of the relevant agent. So, so the main examples of mental states are beliefs and intentions. So beliefs are things that you think are true, so beliefs you hold, and intentions are things like desires, wants, so things that kind of motivate you. Okay, so these kind of mental states of believing and wanting are the main examples of mental states that we appeal to when we're explaining or giving psychological explanations for the things people do. And the crucial thing to note about psychological explanations with regard to explaining action is that the mental states, sorry, the mental states you cite when you're providing a psychological explanation, these mental states both cause and, and justify 
the action that is taking place. Okay? So when you provide a psychological explanation, you're not just providing a cause of what happened, you're also providing something that justifies what happened. Okay? And these mental states, our beliefs and intentions, are, uh, are such that when we cite them in explaining action, we generally provide both causes and um, justification for the actions that we're explaining. So let me give you another example to illustrate how mental states both cause and justify the actions that they explain. Suppose that we are in an actual classroom right now, and you raise your hand. Now, further suppose that one of your classmates asks you, why did you raise your hand? Now, in this first part of this case, imagine that you respond as follows. Well, because certain neurons fired in my cerebral cortex, which sent an electrical signal to the muscles in my arm, which then made my arm raise, etc. Okay? So this is one answer you could give to this question, why did you raise your hand? In this case, you're giving the, the physical or neural cause of what happened. But this question seems to be kind of missing the point. So suppose instead you answer, which, which is maybe the more normal way of answering the question, as follows, because I intend to ask a question, and I believe that raising my hand is the best way to do so. So in this second case, it seems like you're, you know, actually answering this question, and what you're, and what you're doing in this second case, is you're, pro you're citing your mental states, um, like your intentions or like your, your desire, um, as well as your beliefs about how to fulfill that desire. And so what you're doing is when, in, when ans answering the question of why you perform this action in this second case what you're doing is appealing to your mental states. And the reason why this appealing to your mental states makes sense as, this, as an answer to this question is because you're giving the cause of the action, but you're also providing something that makes sense of the action or provides a reason for the action. So you wanting to ask a question and believing that raising your hand is the best way to do so it makes sense of why it's reasonable for you to be raising your hand in that context. So it provides a justification or a reason for that action. Whereas, if you just cite the physical uh, neural cause of why you raise your hand, i.e. simply that um, certain neurons fired, which cause certain electrical signals to go throughout uh, your nervous system, this does provide a cause of the action of raising your hand. However, it doesn't make sense of that action. It doesn't justify that action. It doesn't provide a reason for that action. Um, so, and it's not, a, and because it's not a psychological explanation. Okay. So, in summary, what is very important in order to make sense of human action, or the distinction between human actions and mere happenings is the idea of a psychological explanation which appeals to mental states uh, in explaining action and is such that these mental states both cause and justify the action. Now from this a puzzle arises, a kind of philosophical challenge and the physical the philosophical challenge is as follows. How do these things that we've appealed to, these mental states, how do they both cause and justify our actions? Okay. And we will see in the next video that Fodor motivates his thesis of a language of thought precisely because he thinks it provides uh, a satisfactory answer to this puzzle about how 
uh, how rational action is possible as, as explained by uh, mental states.